This is lecture 38 in the ABCs of Communism series. The Empire Strikes Back, this time against the Guianas. Uh, and when you get your book, it, it's going to be chapter 55 in the 2016 version. Now, when we concluded our discussion of Guiana in chapter 36, that last time, and lecture 19 in this series, Janet Rosenberg Jagan had resigned because of failing health and been succeeded by her finance minister, Bharat Jagdeo, whom she had picked to be her successor. And then Jagdeo was sworn in as president on August 11, 1999. Jagdeo had, himself was born in Unity Village on the east coast of Dem Demerara. Now, subsequently he won two elections in 2001 and then again in 2006. He was the first president of Guyana to relinquish office in accordance with term limits that he signed into the Guyanese constitution in May of 2008. As president, he was signatory to the UNASUR, uh, U-N-A-S-U-R, Constitutive Treaty of the Union of South American Nations. Guyana had, has ratified that treaty and he held a number of global leadership positions in areas of sustainable development green growth and climate change. Donald R. Ramotar succeeded him. Now, Ramotar was, uh, had been General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party, that's the uh, Jagan's party, since 1997. And he lost the 2015 election this year to David Arthur Granger, who was leader of the opposition in the National Assembly of Guyana from 2012 to 2015. When we say he lost, he lost by one seat. In other words, the Grangers Coalition put together enough uh, MPs to have one more vote in the National Assembly than the People's Progressive Party. At any rate, meanwhile, the government granted offshore oil and gas exploration licenses, what are called ODUs, offshore drilling units, within 110 miles off the Atlantic coast of Guyana and that is to be done between 2013 and 2018. However, by 2015, that is by this year, uh, expor the exploration had already uncovered substantial deposits of oil. Now, this is not very surprising to those of us who know the oil business in Latin America. Um, this is certainly predictable. Remember that Guyana geographically is immediately adjacent to Venezuela, which has the biggest petroleum reserves in the world. and uh, we, anybody would have predicted, as of course did the uh, Exxon Mobil and did the and geologists that did the um, expo exploratory work, that that ocean uh, front immediately in, uh, next to Guyana would also produce um, uh, oil and gas when properly explored and, and developed. So these offshore drilling units had paid off virtually at the same time that uh, Granger had won his election. Now, these early elections had been called as a result of a standoff in the National Assembly with the President Rambutar, uh, who had, they were fighting over spending cuts and uh, various kinds of fiscal matters that we don't need to get into here, but the important thing is that that's why these elections were called a little bit early. He had dissolved the National Assembly, the President can do that, he had done it, and then they had set the election date for the 20th of January of this year, 2015. Now, Granger had been the opposition's presidential candidate against Ramatar earlier in 2011 general election, but he had lost that one. And then he stood again in the early part of this year, that is May of 2015, and this time he and his alliance won 33 of the 65 National Assembly seats against the Jagan Party's 32 seats. Now, all of that's just the electoral mechanics. This 70-year-old brigadier, David Arthur Granger, is a retired military officer who had been leader of the opposition in the National Assembly before being elected president. And he had, before, prior to that, served as commander of the Guyana Defense Force and subsequently as national security advisor from 1990 to 1992. Now, what did the exploratory drilling undertaken of 2013 uncover? and what have been the ramifications. 
Well, Guyana is the second poorest country in the Caribbean, only surpassing Haiti in per capita income. And in the last lecture and in the last chapter that we went over all of the history of why that has been the case and how the Jagans had to fight against the Booker interests and the rest of that and finally succeeded in getting control of the country's economy. Now, the country's main economic activity is agriculture, specifically rice and sugar production, and this accounts for about 30 percent of their export income. But on, so far, uh, Guyana hasn't received anything in terms of oil, so it's naturally a very big possible game changer for them, and in the same sense that the canal in Nicaragua is for Nicaragua. Now, we reviewed the history, of, as I say, of imperialist exploitation in Chapter 36, so that despite being surrounded by vast oil and gas reserves in neighboring Venezuela, which today has these largest reserves on the planet in the Orinoco River Basin, and nearby Trinidad and Tobago, up until now, uh, Guyana had no known oil reserves within its territorial boundaries. So the whole picture, potential picture, the economic situation there is vastly changed. As you're going to see when we get to the Dutch and the French, Guyana's uh, oil has changed the world for them too. At any rate, U.S. imperialism enters the picture via ExxonMobil this time. Remember that last time it was the CIA and the FBI busy uh, doing everything they possibly could to uh, get rid of the Jagans. I won't go over that again. And for those of you who are interested, you can go back to that lecture or you can go to that chapter of your book. ExxonMobil is one of the world's largest imperialist oil and gas companies. It is in a protracted war with Venezuela. And in 2007, it lost its Cerro Negro project in Venezuela's Orinoco River Basin when that project was nationalized by the Chavez government. Uh, the Orinoco River Basin had reserve estimates at that time of over 300 billion barrels of heavy crude petroleum. And two companies, ConocoPhillips and ExxonMobil, had had their interests prior to being seized by the Bolivarian government. Now, they, they in turn have sued Venezuela over the nationalization. ConocoPhillips' claim was smaller than Exxon's and has been easier for Venezuela to resolve. But ExxonMobil demanded over $18 billion for the expropriation of its uh, concerns in Venezuela. But the International Arbitration Tribunal eventually ordered the government to pay only $1.6 billion. Now, of course, that's a big difference between $18 billion, which they wanted, and $1.6 billion, which is what they got. And the sum and total of that is that they're really pissed off. So... ExxonMobil created a scheme to get Venezuela's oil in a typically underhanded way. Those of us who know the oil business <laughs> can tell you the kind of things that ExxonMobil has done in, all over the world. And they don't know any other practice than underhanded practices. Since ExxonMobil's bosses own the Obama administration, they found it simple enough to explode hostility against Venezuela. And you may recall recently that Obama declared Venezuela to be an unusual and extraordinary threat to U.S. national security. Now, what he really meant was to ExxonMobil's profits. Accordingly, the gringo regime imposed potentially many sanctions on Venezuelan government officials. Most importantly, the gringo regime helped ExxonMobil get the, what they wanted from Venezuela by making a deal with Guyana over oil deposits in this disputed Essequibo territory. In May of 2015, just as Guyana was swearing in its new president, the conservative military officer David Granger, Granger, by the way, has a history of having been trained and feeded by U.S. military and presumably by CIA, which never sleeps when it comes to subverting popular governments. Um, and this is the way the U.S. Army treats all of the military officers that it can get its hands on in Latin America, always has, um, trying to impress them in one way or another. And um, very often they've been successful, and they've been pretty successful with Mr. Granger too, apparently. According to recent reports, these deposits that have been found by ExxonMobil in their LISA-1 exploratory well are estimated to be about 700 million barrels of oil in that field alone. 
and that it today is worth about 40 billion U.S. dollars. The find could be a major game changer for Guyana, representing more than 12 times its current economic input, that is, if the oil actually belonged to Guyana instead of Venezuela. Now, of course, you can imagine that ExxonMobil and the U.S. government have been making all kinds of financial officer offers and probably payments to Mr. Granger as well. At any rate, he's an older man and this is his last chance to, uh, he's almost my age, he's 70 years old, so this is his last chance to make any money. Gringo political maneuvering. On January 26th of this year, 2015, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden hosted the first Caribbean Energy Security Initiative conference. The objective to get compliant heads of state and willing officials from Caribbean nations together with imperialist executives in Washington, quote, creating conditions to attract private sector investment, unquote, is what they called their maneuver. Biden made the true objective clear when he declared, quote, whether it's the Ukraine or the Caribbean, no country should be able to use natural resources as a tool of coercion against any other country, unquote. Biden was referring to Venezuela and its Petro Caribe program that provides subsidized oil and gas to Caribbean nations at virtually no upfront cost. They do that by allowing, and they, they, they give you the oil right now, give you a 20 year contract where you can pay it back without interest as you can afford to do it once your economy has developed. Now that's something that's really been hard for anybody to turn down for obvious reasons and it's been very successful. Petro Caribe uh, has been fundamental in aiding development in the region during the last 10 years since its creation and it's a threat to imperialist objectives in the Caribbean for obvious reasons and an affront to traditional corporate exploitation of small developing nations. Of course, Biden et al. had to be careful here because the Caribbean countries love Petro Caribe. Therefore, the gringo bosses deftly segued to their idea of bribing whoever they can to get concessions for ExxonMobil and associated imperialist scum. The main conundrum of figuring out how to replace Venezuelan oil and Petro Caribe was on the way to potential resolution when Guyana's new president declared the ExxonMobil find to be Guyanese. Of course, Guyana, ha that has no oil infra infrastructure whatsoever, would have to enter a cooperative agreement with some company to develop the LISA-1 field. Granger, a former instructor at the U.S. Army War College, made a secret trip to the U.S. just three days after taking office in May. Now, one assumes they tried to bribe him with something to give ExxonMobil the right to develop the LISA-1 field because immediately upon his return to Georgetown, ExxonMobil announced that their LISA-1 field was in Guyana's territory, what in fact is the geographic situation where the oil exploration rig Deepwater Champion made its first major discovery. Well, that discovery is in the large Stabrock block in the disputed coastal territory. Now, the ramifications of all of this are that the Venezuelan government warned Exxon to leave the area, citing its claim over the Essequibo territory and the ongoing dispute with Guyana subject to UN mediation. But ExxonMobil paid no heed to Venezuela following President Granger's lead in openly defying the Geneva Agreement and Venezuela's calls to solve the conflict through diplomacy involving the United Nations good offices in the resolution of the centuries-old dispute. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has pledged to send a commission to both Venezuela and Guyana to seek resolution for a problem that now, as Washington hoped, is dividing the region. President Maduro and his foreign minister, Delcy Rodriguez, have been making their case before regional leaders, encouraging other Caribbean nations to support their claim over the Essequibo. Now, whether the UN involvement is and is going to successfully arbitrate that dispute is currently a matter uh, in question. And in the meantime, Guyana continues to aggressively push forward with Exxon to pursue what could become the largest oil theft in the Americas. In a diplomatic visit to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro pledged new resources to that island nation 
and proposed a special economic zone in the Caribbean to strengthen regional trade. The Venezuelan leader visited Antigua, Suriname, St. Lucia, and Grenada to discuss possibilities for a powerful commercial economic zone in the region to protect against the U.S. monopoly. And, of course, Maduro has Venezuelan oil to back it up. Ideas for domination of our peoples are recycled. The old ways of domination now wear new masks, warned Maduro in a meeting with top government officials in St. Vincent. We have what it takes, he continued emphatically, pointing to the existing ties forged by the late Hugo Chavez in, in creating the Bolivarian Alliance for Peoples of Our America, ALBA, ALBA, of which seven Caribbean nations are currently members. Additionally, Venezuela's Petro-Caribe Alliance has for almost a decade supplied 18 neighboring countries with fuel and favorable terms for payment, such as low-interest loans and delayed payment for as long as 20 years, while investing in community projects including hospitals, schools, highways, and homeless shelters. Maduro checked up on a number of such projects initiated by his predecessor, Chavez, including a $32 million fuel storage and distribution plant named after the late president, which currently provides energy for over 90% of St. Vincent, according to official data. The head of state also visited the soon-to-be-opened Argyle International Airport, which received substantial support from Petro Caribe in 2008. Quote, there should be no doubt in our minds that Petro Caribe today is the backbone of the energy, social, and economic development of our region, unquote, said Maduro. And he's now offered to make this available to Guyana. However, what he's dealing with is a president who wants to deal with ExxonMobil, and that would in effect mean giving them at least half of the money that's going to come out of that as a Kibo offshore field. The Venezuelan leader said also that he was seeking a regional hub to serve as the center for construction of more than 50 homes to be financed by the Oil Alliance. He also pledged 7,500 laptops to be distributed to the island nation's government. He's talking about St. Vincent. Despite their broad popularity among member states, Alba and Petro Caribe have met with U.S. disapproval. In January, at a meeting of Caribbean heads of state in Washington, Vice President called Joe Biden called Petro Caribe a tool of coercion in the region. This is one reason why, of course, well, I think we mentioned in the last lecture, the U.S. is currently preparing an invasion of Venezuela, which will require its entire southern, what, the, what it calls Southern Command. And it's moving CIA agents out of Asia, uh, at least, and other places, I suspect, uh, into places like Suriname and French Guiana uh, and Guiana proper in, in order to further this plot to invade Venezuela. In September 2011, Guyana made an application before the UN commissioned on the limits of the continental shelf in order to extend its continental shelf by another, by a further 150 nautical miles. Since the Commission requests that the areas to be considered cannot be subject to any kind of territorial disputes, the Guyanese application disregarded the Venezuelan claim over Guyana by saying that, quote, there are no disputes in the region relevant to the submission of data and information relating to the outer limits of the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical, nautical miles. Well, of course, there are there is this dispute, so that's another matter that's going to come up. Venezuela sent an objection to the commission rejecting the Guyanese application and warning that Guyana had proposed a limit for its continental shelf, including the territory west of the Essequibo River, which is the subject of a territorial sovereignty dispute under the Geneva Agreement of 1966, and within this framework, no matter for the good offices of the Secretary General of the United Nations. Venezuela also said that Guyana consulted its neighbors Barbados, Suriname, and Trinidad Tobago before making the application, but not do the same with Venezuela. Such a lack of consultation with the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, serious in itself in that it violates the relevant rules, is inexplicable insofar as the coast, whose projection is used by the Republic of Guyana in its attempt to extend the limit 
limits forms part of the disputed territory over which the Venezuelan demands land reiterates its claim to sovereignty rights. And that was the official Venezuelan communique. Guyana has also awarded oil exploration rights in the disputed maritime areas to ExxonMobil. And this, of course, has created more um, clashes with Venezuela. So that in October, October 10th to be precise, about a month ago, the Venezuelan Navy detained an oil exploration vessel containing seafloor surveys on behalf of the government of Guyana. The ship and its crew were escorted to the Venezuelan Margarita Island to be prosecuted. The Guyanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs said the vessel was in Guyanese water, but its Venezuelan counterpart sent a diplomatic note to Guyana stating that the ship was conducting oil research in Venezuelan waters with no authorization from the country and demanded an explanation. The vessel named Technic Perlana, together with its crew, was released the next week but its captain was charged with violating Venezuela's, Venezuela's exclusive economic zone. The maritime areas in the Atlantic Ocean where the vessel was conducting its operations are considered by Venezuela as part of its Atlantic front. In accordance with the border treaty signed between Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago in 1990, Venezuela has a long Atlantic front as shown in official maps regardless regardless of its claim over Guyana as a Cuba. <coughs> Despite diplomatic protests from Venezuela, the government of Guyana awarded the U.S. oil corporation ExxonMobil a license to drill for oil in the disputed maritime area in early 2015. That's when it granted the license that no drilling has started yet. In May, the government of Guyana announced that ExxonMobil had indeed found this um, Lysa 1 field in the so-called Stabrock block and uh, an area offshore of the Guyana Esquibo territory of about 27,000 square kilometers. The company announced that further drillings would take place in coming months to better evaluate the potential of the oil field. Venezuela responded to this declaration with a decree on May 27th that includes the maritime area in its dispute in its national maritime protection sphere, thus extending the area that the Venezuela Navy, Navy controls in the disputed area. This in turn caused the government of Guyana to summon the Venezuelan ambassador. And in any kind of military showdown between these two countries, it's not possible for Guyana to stand up to Venezuela unless, of course, they can get some help from, guess who, gringo imperialists. Tensions have further intensified since, and Guyana withdrew the operating license of Conviasa, the Venezuelan national airline, stranding a plane and passengers in Georgetown. Okay, uh, you can see that there's a real mess going on within Guyana, and uh, we won't. What happens there is going to depend in part upon the forthcoming Gringo invasion of Venezuela, and upon their also their ongoing activities on the other side of Guyana. So this takes us to the empire striking back against Suriname. Now Suriname we visited in our initial survey of the Guianas when it was known as Dutch Guiana. Today it is independent and the smallest independent country in South America. Geographically it is situated on the Precambrian Guiana Shield and lies between latitude 1 and 6 degrees north and longitudes 54 and 58 degrees west. The country consists of two main regions, the northern lowland coastal area above the line Albina, Paranam, Waganinjan is cultivated and most of the population lives there. The southern part is tropical rainforest transitioning to sparsely inhabited savanna along the border with Brazil. This section is about 80% of the nation. The two main mountaintop ranges are the Bakuis Mountains in the Van Ash Bawish Mountains, Julian the Top is the highest mountain in the country at 4,219 feet above sea level, and other mountains are uh, then listed. I won't bother going over here because I don't think they'll mean that much to you. Suriname borders French Guiana to the east and Guyana to the west. In the south, it borders on Brazil, and in the north, it opens to the Atlantic Ocean. The borders with French Guiana and Guiana are continuing subjects of dispute. 
not violent dispute, but they're in question. If you've ever been to this part of the country, you know that, uh, I mean, of the world, that uh, once you get into these jungle areas, it's pretty hard to be sure where you are or what you're doing. Lying two to five degrees north of the equator, Suriname has a temperature inveterate, hot, wet, and humid tro tropical climate. It always feels hotter than the registering temperature. The year has two wet seasons from April to August and November to February, and two dry seasons from August to November and February to April. Located in the upper Copanami River watershed, the Central Suriname Nature Reserve has been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There are a number of remarkable national parks in this country, and then I go ahead and list those, and nature reserves. And finally, there is the Sipaliwani Nature Reserve on the Brazilian border. At any rate, on December 25th of 1975, the Dutch government granted independence to the Guiana colony, then led by the NPS, a largely Creole party. Party of that grant was a 10-year aid program worth one and a half billion U.S. dollars. The first president of the country was Johan Ferrier, with Hank Aaron, leader of the NPS, as prime minister. Roughly a third of the population are Dutch settlers, and they emigrated to the Netherlands prior to independence. The empire's concern with Suriname was to use it as a base to attack Guyana and its communist leaders. However, by 1998, the empire was far more concerned with the election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and was now planning to use Suriname as a base to attack Venezuela, and in fact it did use its Suriname bases in the 2002 coup attempt it launched against Chavez. Now back in 1980, the government of Prime Minister Hank Aaron was overthrown in a military coup led by Sergeant Major Desi Boters. The government sponsored, or the Empire sponsored this coup as part of its plan to overthrow the Guyanan government. Accordingly, when President Ferrer refused to recognize the new government, appointing Hank Chin Ah Sen of the National Republican Party as Prime Minister, another CIA coup followed five months later. This time, the army replaced President Ferrer with CIA stooge Chin A. Sen. The new regime banned opposition parties, establishing a typical gringo fascist dictatorship. The Dutch re regime did as told and accepted the new government. However, relations between Suriname and the Netherlands collapsed when the CIA directed the army to kill 15 members of the political opposition on December 8, 1982 in Fort Zeelandia. The event is known as the December Killings. Uh, and then I give you the name in Dutch. In 1985, the ban on opposition parties was lifted and work began on devising a new constitution. The following year saw the start of an anti-government rebellion of Maroons in the interior, calling themselves the Jungle Command and led by Ronnie Brunsrick. The Boutiers government violently tried to suppress the insurgency by burning villages and other similar means, and many Maroons fled to French Guiana. The Republic of Suriname adopted the Constitution in 1987, making it a bourgeois democracy. The legislative branch of government consists of a 51-member, unicameral National Assembly, simultaneously and popularly elected for a five-year term. Suriname's democracy gained some strength after the turbulent 1990s, and its economy became more diversified. Bauxite, that is aluminum ore mining, is the main imperialist investment followed by oil and gold. Agriculture, especially rice and bananas, remains a strong component of the economy, and ecotourism is providing new economic possibilities and opportunities. More than 80% of Suriname's landmass consists of unspoiled rainforest. The establishment of the Central Suriname Nature Reserve in 1998 is the mainstay of ecotourism and signaled Suriname's commitment to conservation. The bauxite industry accounts for more than 15% of GDP and 70% of export earnings. Other main export products include rice, bananas, and shrimp. Suriname has recently started exploiting some of its sizable oil and gold reserves, and about a quarter of the people work in agricultural sector. 
The Surinamese economy is very dependent on commerce, its main trade partners being the Netherlands, the U.S., Canada, and some Caribbean countries, mainly Trinidad and Tobago, and the former islands of the Netherlands Antilles. In the most recent elections held on Tuesday, 25 May 2010, the Mega Combinati won 23 of the National Assembly seats, followed by the National Front with 20 seats. A much smaller number, important for coalition building, went to the A Combinati and the Vox Salienti. Negotiations are ongoing between parties regarding the formation of coalitions. Now, into this thicket, CIA agents have stepped that, as usual, have demonstrated incredible incompetence. One reason for their inept tactical deployment has been their inability to comprehend a strategy not based on simple outright bribery. A person would have to have some education to work inside the politics of Suriname. For example, the president of Suriname is elected for a five-year term by a two-thirds majority of the National Assembly. Alternatively, failing that, by a majority of the People's Assembly. If at least two-thirds of the National Assembly cannot agree to vote for one presidential candidate, a People's Assembly is formed. It then consists of all National Assembly delegates and re regional and municipal representatives who are themselves elected by popular vote in the most recent national election. As head of government, the president appoints a 16-minister cabinet. A vice president, normally elected at the same time as the president, needs a simple majority in the National Assembly or People's Assembly to be elected for a five-year term. There is no constitutional provision for removal or replacement of the president, president unless he resigns. Now these U.S. CIA agents stand there, like U.S. DE agents, they're pretty stupid. And about the only thing they know how to do is to hand somebody some money and say, do this or do that. Uh, when you start putting them through a, a bunch of steps, they get confused and it's really hard for them. Now, in the old days, they used to have suitcases full of cash, so they just hand out money to everybody. But uh, then the problem becomes, what if these guys still fighting among themselves? You've paid them all, but what do you want them to do? So uh, in Suriname, they've been kind of confused. The judiciary is headed by the Court of Justice, the Supreme Court. This court supervises the magistrate courts. Members are appointed for life by the President in consultation with the National Assembly, the State Advisory Council, and the National Order of Private Attorneys. In April 2005, the Regional Caribbean Court of Justice, based in Trinidad, was inaugurated as the final Court of Appeal, and it replaced the London-based Privy Council. Well, the CIA throws Desi Boutiers under the bus. President Desi Boutiers was sentenced in the Netherlands to 11 years of imprisonment for drug trafficking. He is also charged in the December murders case that you recall was the assassination of his opponents in Fort Zeelandia, Paramaribo, in 1982. These two cases place a constraint on relations between the Netherlands and Suriname. Consequently, the Dutch government maintains only the contact necessary to protect its nationals that still live there with the current CIA-installed president. There are still Dutch colonials in Suriname who have to be looked after due to the Dutch colonial history and the re resulting special relationship with the Netherlands. Well, in 1991, the U.S. replaced the Netherlands completely as the imperialist boss of Suriname. Now, the two countries worked together through the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative that we had just discussed and the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief which in initials are PEPFAR. Suriname also receives military funding, of course, from the U.S. Department of Defense, which is one other way of saying that legally providing bribes directly to Army officers, uh, and operations are exclusively run by the U.S. CIA. European imperialism is conducted via traditional intelligence agencies and businesses via the EU, EU CELAC and EU CARIFORUM dialogues or forms utilized. Suriname is party to the Cotonou Agreement and the partnership agreement between the members of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific group of states and the European Union. And there are independent capitalist endeavors. On 17 February 2005, the leaders of Barbados and Suriname signed the agreement for the deepening of bilateral cooperation 
between the government of Barbados and the government of the Republic of Suriname. And in April 2009, both nations formed a joint commission and Paramaribo Suriname to improve relations between both countries and to expand into various areas of cooperation. And this is a, an area where independent capitalists in both Barbados and Suriname want to get involved in joint operations with each other. Since the first meeting, a second one was held in March of 2011 in Dover, Barbados. At the second meeting, several areas of mutual interest were reviewed, including agriculture, trade, investment, and international transport. China and Suriname. In the late 2000s, Suriname intensified development cooperation with other developing countries. China's South-South cooperation with Suriname has included a number of large-scale infrastructure projects that are currently ongoing, including port rehabilitation and road construction. And Brazil signed agreements to cooperate with Suriname in education, health, agriculture, and energy production. Well, after assuming power in the fall of 96, the Wijenbosch government ended the structural adjustment program of the previous government, claiming it was unfair to the poorer elements of society, tax revenues fell as old taxes lapsed, and the government failed to implement new tax alternatives. By the end of 97, Dutch development funds had long since dried up, and the Surinese government relations with the De De Netherlands almost gone, the CIA stepped in and took over. Nevertheless, economic growth slowed in 98, with decline in mining, construction, and utility sectors. Rapid government expenditures, poor tax collection, a bloated civil service, and reduced foreign aid in 99 contributed to the fiscal deficit estimated at 11% of GDP. This government sought to cover this deficit through monetary expansion, which led to a dramatic increase in inflation. And they have lots of problems there. I've listed them and we won't have to go over all of that. But the inflation rate in 2007 was 6.4%. In 26%, in 2010, GDP for was uh, from the U.S. was 4.794 billion, with an annual growth rate of U.S. 3.5 percent per capita GDP was U.S. 9,900 dollars. The current natural resources exploited were bauxite, gold, oil, iron ore, and other minerals, forests, hydroelectric potential, fish, and shrimp. Current agricultural products include rice, bananas, timber, palm kernels coconuts, peanuts, citrus fruits, and forestry products, and in the industrial terms, it's aluminum, oil, gold, fish, shrimp, and lumber. Then I go over through all the trade and import figures for uh, the Suriname for 2012 um, that I'm going to skip over here. We want to get on while we have time to French Guiana. Now, French Guiana is officially called Guiana as an overseas department and region of France. In other words, this is not an independent colony. It never has been. It's always been part of uh, the French nation. And it, of course, is on the North Atlantic coast of South America, bordering Brazil to the east and south and Suriname to the west. It has 32,000 square miles of area, a very low population density, with half of its people living, uh, uh, which is a total of 250,000 people, half of them living in the metropolitan area, of the capital of Cayenne as since at least in the 2013 census. Now, as we discussed last, last time, Native Americans inhabited the area jointly um, um, among various groups, and they were joined by the Europeans and Africans in the 1700s, and we went over all of that in chapter 36. Um, as late as 1848, uh, the French began bringing populations of Vietnamese, such as the Hmong, H-M-O-N-G, and uh, they, they brought them over to uh, French Guiana also. Now, it lies between latitudes 2 and 6 degrees north, longitudes 51, 50 degree, 53 degrees west. It consists of two main geographical regions, the coastal strip, which is the first region where the majority of people live, and a second region, a dense, nearly assess inaccessible rainforest, which gradually rises to the modest peaks of the Tumuk Humac Mountains near the Brazilian frontier. Let me just say this, that uh, this entire northeastern 
corner of South America. It's about the worst jungle I've ever seen. And it's dangerous. I mean, I've seen grizzly bears and black bears and brown bears all over the far north of British Columbia and uh, the Yukon, and there are uh, crocodiles all over the the other side of the, I mean, the uh, western side of the Amazonian River, which are all pretty scary, especially at night. But I've never seen anything as bad as these creatures they have in the uh, in these mountains of the northeastern part of South America, with some of which I've discussed in volume six of my autobiography, autobiography called Third Crusade. Well, French Guiana is no different than uh, the Venezuelan plateau around Angel Falls or any of the jungle interior jungle portions of Guiana proper, that is old British Guiana or Dutch Guiana, which is now Suriname. These are not areas that anybody with any sense wants to go into if they don't absolutely have to. Uh, and I guess enough said about that. Then I list some of these high mountain peaks and their altitudes. There are several small islands found off the coast of French Guiana. Three principal islands are the Islands of Salvation, which include Devil's Island, and the isolated Isles of Conatable Bird Sanctuary, Sanctuary further along the coast towards Brazil. Now, of course, Devil's Island is was made famous. We'll talk about that uh, in the uh, in recent years. The Petit Saut Dam, a hydroelectric dam in the north of French Guiana forms an artificial lake and that provides hydroelectricity for the country. There are many rivers in French Guiana and uh, including the Waukee River. We won't have to go into all of that right now but in 2007 the result, remote Amazonian forest was protected as the Guiana Amazonian Park. The territory of that park covers some 13,000 square miles in the communes of Camel P. Mirapasula, Papachoton, St. Ely, and Saul. French Guiana is home to many different ecosystems, tropical rainforests, coastal mangroves, savannas, enselbergs, and many types of wetlands. It has a high level of biodiversity in both flora and fauna, and this is due to the presence of old growth forests, that is ancient primary forests, which are biodiversity hotspots. The rainforests of French Guiana provide shelter for many species during dry periods and terrestrial glaciation. These forests are protected by the Guiana Amazonian Park and its six additional nature reserves, the International Union for Conservation of Nature and the European Union have recommended special efforts to protect these areas. Now, the U.S. takeover of the French banking system that occurred with the collapse of the U USSR made its overseas that's French's, France's overseas provinces, uh, province of Guiana, subject to U.S. CIA dictate. For the time being, therefore, the Gaullist opposition to U.S. imperialism was defeated. Accordingly, the U.S. was able to use French Guiana, along with Suriname, for striking back against not only Guyana, but also Venezuela, and it did. Now, however, with the U.S. caught in the global quag quagmire of opposition to U.S. rule, including the conundrum of putting sanctions onto Russia in direct contradiction to its own interests, for, that it, we're talking about France now, another change is at hand. If France rejects the social democracy of Hollande, as other West European nations are rejecting their own social democratic misleaders, then French Guiana will have the opportunity to become truly independent of both French imperialism and Gringo imperialism as well. Now, of course, the official language is French, which is joined by other languages, most prominently French Guianese Creole and other Creole languages, and the American Indian languages, and the Hmong, the Vietnamese uh, people's language. As a French region, Guiana is inside the European Union, so its official currency is the euro. The region is the most prosperous territory in South America, with the highest GDP per capita. A large part of Guiana's economy derives from the presence of the Guiana Space Center, now the European Space Agency's primary launch site near the equator. Now, taking a closer look at this Guiana Space Center, which is responsible for the high income of the people that live there, 
1964, Guiana became the spaceport for France. In 1975, France offered to share Kourou, that's the town where the spaceport is located, with the European Space Agency, ESA. Non-European companies buy commercial launches also. The ESA pays two-thirds of the spaceport's annual budget. It financed the upgrades made during the development of the RANE launchers. That's A-R-I-A-N-E. The uh, Centre Spatial Guyana, CSG, Guyana Space Centre, is therefore a French and European spaceport in Kourou, in French Guiana, and it began its official operations there in 1968. And it fulfills two major geographical requirements for such a site. It is quite close to the equator, so that the spinning Earth can import, impart some extra velocity to the rockets for free when launched eastward. And it has the uninhabited territory, in this case open sea to the east, so that lower stages of rockets and debris from launch failures cannot fall on human habitations. The European Space Agency, the ESA, the French Space, A Space Agency, CNES, National Center for Space Studies, and the commercial Ariane Space Company conduct launches from Kourou. This was the spaceport used by the ESA to send supplies to the International Space Station using the automated transfer vehicle. Now after that I've, going, I've gone through a list of all of the launches of any import that have been done from that space center right up through 2015. Now following the Grinnell Environmental Roundtable of 2007, the Grinnell Law No. 2 was proposed in 2009 and then I'm giving you the, uh, the French legal uh, description. Article 49 of the law proposed the creation of a single organization responsible for environmental conservation in French Guiana. Article 64 proposes a departmental plan of mining orientation for French Guiana, which would promote mining, specifically of gold, that is compatible with requirements for environmental protection. The coastal environment along the N1 highway has histor historically experienced the most changes. Most development is occurring locally along the N2 and in western French Guiana due to gold mining. There are <coughs> 5,500 plant species recorded, including more than 1,000 trees, along with 700 species of birds, 177 species of mammals, over, the five, over 500 species of fish, including 45% of which are endemic, and 109 species of amphibians. The microorganisms would be much more numerous, especially in the north, which competes with the Brazilian Amazon, Borneo, and Sumatra. This single French department has at least 98% of vertebrate fauna and 96% of vascular plant, plants for all of France and its overseas territories. The threat to eco is in the ecosystem or habitat fragmentation by the roads, which remain very limited compared to other forests of South America. Impact of immediate and deferred Petit South Dam, a gold mining, poor control of hunting and poaching facilitated by the creation of many tracks and the appearance of all-terrain vehicles has all uh, brought the question of the sustainability of the ecosystems into question. Logging remains moderate due to the lack of roads on both the difficulties of climate and terrain which means there's lack of illegal roads. Uh, an ordinance of the 2005 extended the forest code in French Guiana, but with important exceptions and modifications. In an approach that will be sustainable, concessions or free transfers may be granted by local authorities or other entities for use by persons of traditional origin. But the means of doing so are no longer tra uh, traditional means. So the Guyanese ecosystem is vulnerable and the impacts of logging and hunting are important. The beaches are a, a natural reserve of the Amana, the joint Awala Yalima Papo in the west, and the exceptional marine turtle nesting site there. This is one of the largest worldwide nesting sites for leatherback turtles. On the other hand, French Guiana has some of the poorest soils in the world. The soil is low in nutrients because of the constant rainfall so it's low in nitrogen and potassium and organic matter. Soil acidity is another cause of poor soils, 
and it requires farmers to add lime to their fields. All of these soil characteristics have led to the use of slash and burn agriculture where resulting ashes elevate soil pH, that is lower soil acidity, and contribute minerals and other nutrients to the soil. Sites of terra preta or anthropogenic soils occur in French Guiana, particularly near the border with Brazil. Research is being actively pursued in multiple fields to determine how these enriched soils were historically created and how this can be done in modern times. As an integral part of France, French Guiana is part of the European Union and the Eurozone, and therefore, as I've said, its currency is the Euro. Well, at any rate, uh, I'll go, go through some of the economic data about French Guiana, which I won't uh, go over here, because you can read it in the book when you get it. If you're interested, or look it up. As, if you're using the book as a research source, you'll have all of those details on uh, the uh, economy of French Guiana in all of its specific areas. French population, or the entire population of French Guiana, is a little over 250,000 as of the 2013 census. Most people live along the coast. They are very ethnically diverse. And then I go through the, uh, the diversity in detail by department. Um, there's a, the main groups living in the interior are so-called Bush Negroes. Maroons, who are of African descent, and American Indians groups. The Maroons are descendants of escaped African slaves and they live primarily along the Moroni River. The main Maroon groups are the Saramaka, the Alcan, both of whom also live in Suriname, and the Boni, or sometimes called the Aluku. Um, and then I've got it gone through the European ancestry of the Dutch, British, Spanish, Portuguese, the Chinese and the uh, Hmong people from Asia uh, in some detail. If you're interested in that, you'll have that in your book when you get it. The total fertility rate in French Guiana has remained high and is today considerably higher than in metropolitan France and higher than the average of French overseas departments. It's largely responsible for the high population growth of French Guiana and uh, can, you can imagine that there isn't a hell of a lot to do down there except uh, procreate. The hell of a, I mean, in your spare time. <laughs> the official language of French Guiana is French, and it is the predominant language of the department. And then I've gone through all of the different Indian languages uh, and other languages that are there. You'll have that when you want it. Um, it's the largest landmass for an area outside of Europe since Greenland left. The European community in 1985. With one of the longest EU external boundaries, it is one of only three European Union territories outside Europe that is not an island. The others are the Spanish autonomous cities in Africa of Ceuta and Melilla, and, <coughs> the, uh, and as an integral part of France, its head of state is thus the President of the French Republic, and its head of the government is Prime Minister of France. The French government and its agencies have responsibility for a wide range of issues that are reserved to the national executive power, such as defense and external relations. Now, this has been a matter of concern back and forth between the U.S. and France over the century or so, the last century or so, because of uh, the U.S. wanting to get rid of every European power from the Western Hemisphere, and that's been an off-and-on sort of thing. At the moment, since U.S. banks control the French government, uh, it isn't really much of a problem, but that's liable, it's liable to become a problem pretty quickly because this collapse of the present French regime, and I don't mean just the social democratic government, but I mean the entire regime of U.S. running France, uh, is about at hand. And if a, there's a return of another Gaullist executive, you can expect, bet that this question of conflict with the U.S. over French Guiana is going to come again. But for the moment, the president of France appoints a prefect, and his residence is at the prefecture building in the city of Cayenne as his representative to head the local government of French Guiana. There are two local executive bodies, the 19-member departmental council and the 34-member regional council. Both are elected. They will be united into only one council, the Assembly of Guiana, uh, on the January 1st next year, that is of 2016 and they will have authority on exactly the same territory. 
French Guiana sends two deputies to the French National Assembly, one representing the commune, that is the municipality of Cayenne, and the other the commune or municipality of Mokuria, and the other representing the rest of French Guiana. The latter constituency is the largest in the French Republic by land area. French Guiana also sends two senators to the French Senate. The Guyanese Socialist Party uh, dominates politics in French Guiana. Now, as to the subject of illegal gold, clandestine gold prospectors from Brazil and Suriname compete with legal mining operations in French Guiana. Now, the border between French Guiana and Suriname, the Moroni River, flows through rainforest and is difficult for the gendarmerie and the French Foreign Legion to patrol, try as they might. The French government began to combat illegal gold mining in French Guiana with Operation Anaconda in 2003. This had mixed results and was followed by Operation Harpy in 2008-09 and then Operation Harpy reinforced in 2010. Colonel Francois Mueller, the commander of French Guiana's gendarmes, believes these operations have been successful. Successful. However, after each operation ends, Brazilian miners return. Soon after Operation Harpy reinforced began, an alteration took place. An altercation took place between French authorities and Brazilian miners. On the 12th of March of 2010, a team of French soldiers and border police were attacked while returning from successful operation, during which the soldiers had arrested 15 miners, confiscated three three boats and seized 617 grams of gold, currently worth about 22,000 U.S. dollars. <coughs> there was a shootout. The illegal miners returned to reprieve their lost loot and their colleagues. Uh, between the, there was a shootout between the soldiers and these miners, and uh, the, managers, the miners managed to retake one of their boats and about 500 grams of gold and their colleagues. The violent reaction by the Brazilian interlopers can be explained by the exceptional take of 617 grams of gold. Well, which is exceptional to them. At any rate, in terms of air service, French Guiana has its main airport is Cayenne, uh, and it's located in the commune of Maturia, southern suburb of Cayenne. There are two flights a day to Paris, to the Orly Airport, served by Air France and Air Caribes. The flight time from Cayenne to Paris is 8 hours and 25 minutes, and from Paris to Cayenne it's 9 hours and 10 minutes. There are also flights to Fort de France, Pointe de Petre, Port au Prince, Miami, and Balaam. Ocean Connections French Guiana's main seaport is the port of De Grade de Gans, located on the estuary of the Mohuri River in the commune of Ramir Monjoli, a southeast suburb of Cayenne. Almost all of French Guiana's imports and exports pass through this port of Cannes, built in 1969, replacing the old harbor of Cayenne. Now, the land connections are that there is an asphalt road from Regina to St. George's to a town called Loya Polk, a town by the Brazilian border that was opened in 2014. This completed the road from Cayenne to the Brazilian border. It is now possible to drive on a fully paved road from St. Laurent de Morin to the Surinese border to St. George's Oyapoc on the Brazilian border. The Oyapoc River Bridge over the Oyapoc River, marking the border with Brazil, opened in December two years ago. This bridge is the first land crossing ever opened between French Guiana and Brazil, and indeed between French Guiana and the rest of the world. No other bridge crosses the Oyapoc River, and no bridge crosses the Moroni River, marking the border with Suriname. There is a ferry crossing, however, at Albina to Suriname, so you can drive your car onto that and go across that way. Now, with the Oyapok River Bridge, it is possible to drive without interruption from Cayenne to Macapa, the capital of the state of Amapa in Brazil. And in Cayenne, we have 106,000 of the inhabitants of the country in that urban area. And uh, if you take in what they call the metropolitan area of Cayenne, you can get it up to 121,000. Uh, then I go through the town populations and the distribution of military and security forces, which I won't go over here. But I'll conclude this part about French Guiana with some comments about Papillon. You know the novel Papillon was written 
by the French convict Henry Chacherier in set in French Guiana, published in France in 1969, describing his escape from the French penal colony. He was an instant bestseller, translated into English from the original French by June P. Wilson and Walter P. B. Michaels. He was published in a 1970 edition by Patrick O'Brien and adapted for a Hollywood film of the same, nation, same name. Ch Charrier stated that all events in the book are truthful, allowing for minor lapses in memory. As usual in such cases, there has been a controversy over its accuracy. But I'm not going to go into the controversy because uh, ha having escaped from prison myself in South America, I can tell you that the best thing I ever did was to get sit down and write all of my experiences based upon letters I had written home and photocopies of letters that had been sent to me as soon as I got there. But in the years that have passed, decades actually, that have passed since that time, my memory has naturally gotten confused on some points. And I, I'm sure the same things happened to this writer about his experiences in the French penal colony. The important thing about Papillon is the um, social discussion that I think that goes on inside the book about what was happening in France, what was happening in its penal colony, and what was happening inside the prison. Uh, now, just one last set of comments. The USCIA never rests when it comes to causing trouble for um, people that are trying to fight for their independence and uh, national development. So all of this in Northeast South America now centers around its current invasion, CIA and Southern Command's current, in, current plan for invasion within the next days or weeks of uh, Venezuela. Um, not that they couldn't delay it again, because they have delayed it before, but I think they're getting to the point where they realize that it's, that it's now or never. And if they can't get rid of uh, Maduro this year, they'll probably never be able to get rid of him or the entire Bolivarian experiment. And uh, so it's, it's countdown time there. And of course you know they're having trouble in Syria, in Ukraine, and... Uh, on the South China Sea, so South America is going to be one of those areas that's being contested. The next year is going to be a very interesting year to live through. Now, frankly, I never thought I would live to see the end of the empire, but I think we're beginning to see, I think this is the beginning of the end, and uh, I don't know how long this is going to take. It could take quite a long time, or it could be over almost immediately. If there's a general financial collapse, as so many financial people think that there will be, then, of course, that will exacerbate all of these foreign operations. But which direction they'll go, who knows? So this is going to be a very interesting period to live through. With that comment, I'm going to stop with our discussion of Northeast South America and the empire striking it back against all of the Guianas. And in the next lecture, which won't be for another couple of weeks probably, um, I'm going to be talking about Colombia.